Squamish people, the first people of Seattle. Um, and now I'm, I'm really pleased to introduce our speaker, Miranda Rothler. She's a PhD student in the Padilla Gaminio lab at SAS. She researches the effects of climate change on Puget Sound bull kelp physiology and carbon cycling in kelp beds around Puget Sound. Before starting at UW, Miranda worked as a research technician at the Southern California Coastal Water Research Project on documenting the effects of harmful algal bloom toxins and the effects of climate change on pteropods, oysters, and dungeness crab. She'll present some of her PhD results during the Quant seminar today. Uh, Miranda will take questions as we go during the talk. Um, and thanks everyone for coming today. And a big thank you to Miranda for sharing your work um, with us today. And so turn it over to you. Thanks. All right, I'm so excited to be giving a quant sem talk. Never did I think that I would be invited to give a quant sem talk as a physiologist, but um, thanks to coronavirus, my first thesis chapter was um, entirely quantitative because I physically could not access our lab space or the field. Hence my first thesis chapter, <laughs> impacts of climate change, ocean, ocean warming and acidification on kelps. Um, I will say I just submitted this manuscript like last week. Um, so it's been a long slog to get this out. But um, I, as a non-quant quantitative person, I've definitely learned a lot through this process. Um, and so I also kind of wanted to, to kind of share my methodology and my experience um, in case anyone else was interested in conducting meta-analyses. Um, so I wanted to start out by talking about uh, kelps in Puget Sound, because we live in Puget Sound and it's actually a really unique place to study kelps because we have one of the highest diversities of kelp taxa in our local waters. Um, you guys are probably used to seeing um, the giant canopy forming bull kelp and giant kelp, but there are actually a lot of other understory taxa that are just below the surface. Um, and this makes Puget Sound a really species rich and unique place to study kelp. Um, kelp are really important because they provide critical habitat for species like juvenile salmon, rockfish, abalone, and in that way, kelp provides food for a bunch of higher trophic levels like otters, seals, even orca. Um, kelp provides protection from strong waves and currents. So in this picture, you can see it's really grainy, so it's hard to tell, but you can see that inside the kelp bed, the water is really still. And then outside, the current is moving really swiftly. So kelp is helping to dampen wave action. And on a really macro scale, this helps with things like coastal erosion. Um, and of course, it's beautiful to recreate in if you're a scuba diver or a kayaker. Um, it's really gorgeous. And then in Puget Sound, uh, kelp farming is really taking off. It's a really cool economic opportunity for our region. Um, there's two kelp farms that are currently at the very end of their permitting process, both on Bashan Island. And there's, I don't know, like eight or 10 more that are in various other stages of permitting. So it's really taking off in the Puget Sound region. Um, it's a highly sustainable crop. You don't have to put anything into it. You kind of just set it and forget it out in the field. Um, and uh, shellfish farmers are also really interested in co-culturing kelp along with their shellfish stock because kelp, by taking up CO2, it can, it can help raise the pH of the water. Um, and so in theory, this is yet to be like definitively proven by um, in practice, but in theory, they can create this halo of high pH water around the shellfish, thereby protecting them from ocean acidification um, and doubling the farmer's yield. Uh, in terms of products, there are a ton of things you can do with seaweed. Uh, one of my favorites is this company in Alaska, Barnacle, Barnacle Seafoods, that makes uh, kelp salsa and hot sauce that is really good. Highly recommend you check out. Um, but also a lot of other food products, biofuel, cosmetics, I have a kelp uh, like shower gel right now. Um, uh, and then it can also be used for fertilizer and animal feed. Uh, so it has a lot of uses, it has really high in vitamins and nutrients. So it's a really cool crop. Um, that being said, kelp is not immune to climate change. If you look at uh, the global statistics, just over a third of kelp beds are declining. I will say this statistic is about 10 years old. So it's probably a little bit out of date. But these declines are really regionally focused. So for example, there was a really strong um, uh, heat wave that happened 
because of the blob in 2014 and Northern California lost over 95% of their kelp canopy cover. Most of that has grown back, um, but not all of it. And it, it has been really, really slow to recover in some places. And then here in Puget Sound, there was recently a study that found that since the 1800s, South Puget Sound has lost about 65% of their kelp canopy cover. So that's really substantial. Um, just to kind of see it visually, this is uh, sort of the, the disappearance event in Northern California. So on these maps, um, the green is the kelp beds pre uh, the blob heat wave. And then on the right is after the heat wave. And you can see that all the green is gone. The kelp bed is depleted. And the reasons for this decline were really complicated and people are still kind of debating about it. But basically it was because of this like perfect storm of factors, which I, I love this illustration of a little storm. Um, so basically uh, there was there was the blob that was happening coinciding with a warm El Nino phase um, that coincided with a uh, purple urchin bloom that also coincided with sea star wasting disease, which the sea stars eat the urchins so that led to more urchins. All of this happened um, and then the urchins ate the kelp forest and all of the kelp disappeared. Similarly, um, in Puget Sound, this is from a really cool paper that I recommend you guys check out if you if this is a topic that interests you, um, where they uh, reconstructed historical um, maps of, of where kelp, kelp was uh, in Puget Sound because sailors in like the 1800s used to mark where the kelp beds were because they didn't want to sail into them. So they were able to use that data to reconstruct historical kelp beds. And so in this graph, this is South Puget Sound and everywhere that is in blue is where there used to be kelp and there is no longer kelp. And then the pink is where there's still kelp. And you will see that this map is primarily blue. Um, there's a sad little population here in Squaxin Island, which people are, the, the Squaxin Island tribe and uh, Puget Sound Restoration Fund are actively working to preserve this population. This is like an active ongoing effort. And then besides that, it's mostly just up here, the Tacoma Narrows, that the, the kelp has persisted. And we think that this is because um, in South Puget Sound, obviously you have less water movement than the rest of the sound. And it's also some of the warmest water. And so during the summer, you can get really intense uh, stratification where the warm water is really trapped at the top, which is where the bull kelp primarily is. Um, and then the, the, uh, the Tacoma Narrows, by contrast, is going to have really, really rapid water movement because all the water is being squeezed through here. So they think that because um, there are strong currents in this region, kelp has been able to persist in this area, but not in the rest of South Puget Sound. Okay, so the example that ties these two uh, case studies together is that ocean warming is having a strong negative effect on kelp. But of course, ocean warming is not happening in a vacuum because anthropogenic CO2 is also causing ocean acidification. And the really important thing to remember about warming and acidification is that they are actively reinforcing each other on both a chemical and a biological level. Um, and that's because ocean warming is leading to things like increased respiration, decreased photosynthesis, which is leading to more CO2, less O2, that is in turn pumping more CO2 back into the atmosphere and also increasing ocean acidification. All of that to say, these two stressors are really tightly linked together, and we expect them to co-occur in future oceans. And so when we think about studying the effects of climate change on an organism, it can be really beneficial to think about them as sort of tandem stressors that are going to be happening together. That being said, it's pretty clear what the effects of ocean warming are going to be on kelps, because we can visually go out in the field and see it, but it's a lot less clear what the effects of ocean acidification are. Now, when we think about OA and kelps, we kind of have to switch our thinking because we're used to thinking about ocean acidification um, with organisms that have shells um, like coral reefs or oysters and mussels and ocean acidification is gonna be really bad for those guys because it's gonna dissolve their calcium carbonate skeleton. But kelps don't have a car <laughs> calcium carbonate skeleton. Um, they photosynthesize. So they're taking up carbon dioxide, they're releasing oxygen. And then of course they respire like other organisms when they don't have a light source. So if you're adding more CO2 to the water, they're probably just gonna photosynthesize more, which is good. Um, this, so basically we think that ocean acidification is probably gonna be positive for them. This is actually kind of an oversimplification. There are definitely some, still some negative physiological consequences of ocean acidification. 
Um, and there are some reasons uh, physiologically why kelps won't benefit from, from extra CO2 in the way that other algae will that I'm not gonna go into. Um, but at the end of the day, it seems like uh, OA is gonna have either a positive or kind of a net neutral effect on kelps. So we're in this interesting situation where we have this one stressor that we know is gonna have a really negative physiological effect on them. And this other stressor that is maybe gonna help them is maybe gonna be neutral, we don't really know. And so understanding how those stressors are gonna interact with each other and affect kelp together is really interesting. Okay, the other factor that really complicates uh, when you're thinking about kelp in response to climate change is that they have a very complicated life cycle. Um, they have what is known as a biphasic life cycle. Um, so do jellyfish, so do mushrooms. Um, so basically the adult sporophyte that we're probably the most familiar with seeing out in the field is diploid. This will produce sores, uh, spores that then germinate into gametophytes. Um, these guys are only a few cells big, but they are actually adults. So these are the offspring and they have separate sexes. They're haploid. Um, these guys will then, the male will release sperm that will um, fertilize the egg of the female gametophyte. And then um, the juvenile sporophyte will start growing out of that female gametophyte and then eventually grow into the adult sporophyte. So we have generation one, generation two, generation three. Um, and the crazy thing about this life cycle is that in Puget Sound, this whole thing is happening once every year. So this really speaks to how quickly their populations turn over and also to how, how uh, impressive their growth rates are, because these guys will get incredibly tall just over one growing season. Um, and because these different life cycles are completely different sizes, um, we would expect that stressors could impact them very differently. So when we're thinking about complicating factors in terms of the effects of climate change on kelp, some things we have to consider are that when you have two stressors or two or more stressors that are in combination, sometimes the effects can be really unexpected and not match up to what the effects of a single stressor alone will be. Um, it, it could be that the life stages are gonna react very differently to stressors too. Um, and then the other thing I just wanted to mention with kelp specifically is that um, there is a really intense local adaptation and that's because um, we think that they, they reproduce with themselves quite often. Um, if you think about this sort of reproductive uh, strategy, they're basically, they have these, these patches of spores that they then drop to the ocean floor and then the spores are released and just swim around until they find other spores and germinate with them. Um, so odds are just as likely that they're gonna germinate with a spore also from the same parent as with a spore from a different parent. So this is kind of a black box. Like we don't know exactly how much selfing is happening, um, but based on some preliminary ge genetic studies, it does seem like it's quite common for them to reproduce with themselves. Um, and so because of that, if you look at the genetic makeup, even of a place that is relatively small, like Puget Sound, um, there are at least two or three different really distinct genetic populations, like even within Puget Sound. So there's lots of local adaptation um, that's really specific to the specific environment they're living in. And that can mean that environmental stressors that are coming in can hit them a little bit harder if they're hyper-specialized to the specific environmental niche. Okay, the other complicating factor when we're thinking about comparing results across multiple studies is that people measure physiological metrics in many different ways. Um, this is valuable because it makes your study stand out and it's a cool, it's cool to discover a new way to measure something. However, when you're comparing studies, it can make it really hard. So for example, this is a sugar kelp. And here are some of the ways that I, after looking through the literature, people were measuring growth in sugar kelp. People were measuring it just, just based on the length, either as a discrete value or a rate through time, which could be a rate a rate, just a solid percent, percent per day, millimeters per day. People were also looking at width or diameter, same questions. People were doing this thing called a hole punch method where basically you punch a hole in the kelp and then you can either see how long it takes to heal and sort of um, measure the surface area of that hole or because kelp grow like, like a conveyor belt. So they'll always start growing down here. And then this end will slowly disintegrate 
So you can also measure how much the hole travels across the kelp, and that's a measure of growth. Um, you can also measure the surface area or the change in surface area. You can also measure the wet weight or the change in wet weight, or you can measure the dry weight or the change in dry weight. So it's like, well, if you're looking at two papers and one of them is measuring weight and one of them is measuring like how far this hole punch traveled, like how, <laughs> like you're like, okay, well, the growth increased, I guess, like, you know, but it's really hard to directly compare those results. So this is where meta-analysis comes in. It can be a really powerful way to um, be able to more easily compare physiological studies. Um, even if those studies didn't measure exactly the same thing. Um, and this can be valuable because it allows us to draw broad conclusions and pick out general trends in the field. And it can also help us identify knowledge gaps in literature and things that are understudied, um, which can help with study design. Or if you are at the beginning of your degree and you're looking for knowledge gaps to um, exploit for your degree, it can be really helpful. Okay, can we get a temperature check on how people, um, how familiar people are with meta-analyses, like thumbs up, middle down, like completely have done it before, are medium about it, have no idea. Okay, solid mix, love it. <laughs> okay, um, so the like very, very basic concept of a meta-analysis is you're calculating this metric called effect size. And effect size is basically just the difference between your control and your treatment values. So if your effect size is small, that means the control and the treatment aren't that different from each other. If the effect size is large, that means your control and your treatment are gonna be very different from each other. And so in this, in this context, control and treatment would be like your control temperature and your elevated temperature, your control pH, your lowered pH. Okay, so when I was conducting this analysis, the first thing I did was I just read a lot of papers um, and I kind of got a sense for the literature and what was going on. Then I came up with some very specific goals and questions that I wanted to answer with this meta-analysis. And with that, I came up with very specific search terms that I was gonna use to do the literature search. When you do the literature search, it has to be very formal. You have to do it as a discrete literature search. Um, you have to record things like the exact search terms you use, the exact search date you do it on, the number of hits you get, all of that information, the peer reviewers will want with your manuscript. <laughs> um, important to know. Um, also, peer reviewers do not like Google Scholar. So you can use Google Scholar, but you also have to back it up with a more legit database like Web of Science. That is a very popular one. Um, so these are really important to keep in mind. Uh, okay, so my analysis goals um, and this is just lifted straight from my manuscript, is the first, my first question I had was figuring out how ocean acidification, warming, and their interaction were going to affect kelp physiology. Second question was figuring out whether all life stages were equally vulnerable to these stressors. Third question was looking at physiological response types. So things like growth, pre-production, stress response, which ones are actually going to be impacted by these stressors, which ones are going to be pretty resilient. Fourth question was looking at how experimental methodology, so like study locations, species examined, intensity, duration of exposure, how all of those things impact species response. I have a yeah. Going back to your uh, the one thing I always look for when I'm reviewing and maybe rejecting these papers is publication bias, mm -hmm. which is if you don't find an effect, you don't get published. Yes. And how did you deal with that? I think. This is interesting because especially that's a really good point. And that is, I would say, extra true with climate change studies. Yeah. Um, you don't find it. In exactly. So I will say when I, I, I did, I did look for publication bias. That was part of the analysis I did. And I didn't bring it up in this presentation. So it's a good thing you brought it up. Um, there was publication bias with the ocean warming papers. There was not publication bias with the ocean acidification papers. So that's just kind of a fact. Like. I can't really change that. So I reported it and, and that's kind of all I could do. Um, cause I completely agree that there is, there is bias and yeah. What we do is look at the literature. Uh -huh. Because usually it ends up in some progress report, just NSF, mm -hmm. but you can't get it published with the wrong answer. Cause then we, we know that climate must affect something because you don't find it it's the unpublished. Uh, but oh, I agree with you, the OA stuff, because OA is so variable, you do yeah. have to get negative results published. But yeah. Looking at great literatures, even though it's not pure, might actually get you a, a less biased sample of 
resources. And again, I don't know your field well enough to know how easy it is to find things like reports to, to NSF and mm -hmm. funding bodies and all sorts of weird ones. It is really important. Yeah, okay, that, that's really good to know. Um, yeah, I, I didn't know that. Um, yeah, it is It is definitely a huge problem <laughs> in the field. Um, so yeah, the, the way that I conducted the literature search is starting with this question, I then you use very specific queries. So in this case, um, to identify the kelp taxa that I wanted, I did kelp, Laminarias, which is the Latin group, macroalgae, brown algae, and then combine that with a bunch of words about temperature, so temperature, thermal, warming, heat, a bunch of words about acidification, acidification, CO2, PCO2, pH, a bunch of general terms about climate change, climate change, environmental change, global change, future climate, and then just some general kind of like catch-all experimental phrases like stress, performance. Um, so that literature search ultimately yielded about 6,000 studies, um, which was a lot. Um, I was able to eliminate like the vast majority of them just based on skimming the, the title and in some cases then skimming the abstract and saying, okay, this isn't actually relevant to me. Um, then you eliminate some based on just they're not they're not quite the right study. So for example, for my for my um, analysis, I was only looking at um, experimental studies. Um, so, cause I wanted to really look at like tightly controlled laboratory conditions. So eliminated any that were conducted in the field review papers. And yeah, I, I did, I did eliminate anything that wasn't peer reviewed, um, just to kind of constrain, um, the, the study, because I, I was already, I definitely went into this project, not realizing how vast the literature was going to be on this topic. Um, and so even when I ended up with 139 studies, um, it took me a very long time to get through all those papers. Um, but I ended up uh, downloading about 364 of them and then eliminating over half of them just based on other factors, like they weren't the right species, data weren't in the right format. Um, that was really common, especially from papers um, from like the, the 80s and 90s. It was less common to report um, means and standard de deviations and sample sizes. Um, and if those if that information wasn't included, I couldn't include the paper. Um, also, it was a lot less common to have your raw data in a repository. And so, um, again, that just eliminated some papers. Um, some of the data was too specialized. So for example, if it was a paper focusing on genetic sequencing, that's really hard to compare um, studies to each other. So that data had to be excluded, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then also if if authors were, if the data looked good, but couldn't be included for some reason, like box plots, for example, didn't have the information I needed. So I'd reach out to the authors. I'd contact them multiple times. I tried to contact at least a couple of the authors by kind of stalking them online. Um, <laughs> And responsive rate was pretty low, but I did get a few people to respond to me and was able to include some of their data. Um, so at the very end of the day, I ended up with 139 papers. Um, the way that I built this database, I am sure that there are more sophisticated ways to build out a database, but this is the way that I did it, um, is I just created a big, big Excel file. Um, the first thing I included was just a bunch of like demographic information about the study, um, including the species, the location, the stressor, the life stage. Um, then I actually extracted the data if assuming they didn't have an external database um, using this um, website called Webplot Digitizer. Again, I'm sure that there are more sophisticated methods out there, especially now. Um, but Webplot Digitizer is very easy to use. Basically, you just copy and paste the graphic into the website. Um, and then, uh, in the website, you then, um, use just your cursor to mark where the axes are, and then you tell the program what, what values those axes actually are. Um, so in this case, it's zero and a hundred. Um, and then you go through with your cursor and you just mark where all the points are. Um, and you can kind of use this little zoomed in area over here to get it really, really exact. Um, I spent so many hours doing this. <laughs> Naughty, this was like my whole coronavirus experience because <laughs> just in Webplot Digitizer, um, I think we have like a, I don't know, parasocial relationship at this point. Um, but 
uh, it's it's really nice. It just spits out the data for you. Um, here I'm lowering the number of significant figures to actually match what was reported in in the manuscript, so I wasn't just making up um, significant figures. And uh, then you just download it, and you have the data right there. Um, so yeah, pretty. <laughs> yeah, so it's a simple program, but it, it works pretty well. Um, I will say it works less well. I I chose like the nicest example I could possibly find. But for for example, um, if you have if you had line graphs and some of the points were overlapping and some of the error bars were overlapping, it got really tricky really quick. Um, and scatter plots, like forget about it. That was, you know, so there's definitely some things that it doesn't work with, but for very simple plots, it works amazing. Um, so then for each paper, you basically end up with this list where each, each of those bars is gonna be its own line here in the database. And so um, you have the metrics, you have, again, like demographic information, like the, the experimental duration, the sample size, and then you have the pH, the temperature, and then finally over here is the actual data. Um, yeah. So we just said, how frequently uh, were not reporting errors in their, their plots? That's a great question. Um, I would say, okay, I would say it was pretty, like most people did. Um, I would say, okay, actually most papers in the 80s and 90s did not report error. So it was rare to find one that, that did report error. Um, in like the two thousands onwards, it was, most people did report error. Some people just didn't, a lot of people would include error bars and then not say what the error bars yeah. represented. Um, this one woman I reached out to actually said, I emailed her and she was like, oh my God, I have no memory. That was the first paper that I published as part of my dissertation. And I honestly do not remember what it was, sorry. And I was like, okay. Cool. I guess I'll just not include your paper then. Thank you so much. Um, so, but I would say, I would say generally people do report it and it was, it was pretty rare. Like you could see in that other example I showed that I, I included like 140 papers and there were only seven that I actually had to like kick out of the database because they didn't, I wasn't able to contact them and get all the information I needed. So, so pretty uncommon, but definitely exists. Yeah. Does that answer? Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, okay, so just some general information about the study pool that I ended up with. Um, this shows um, each study that ended up in the database of those 139 studies based on publication year. And then the colors correspond to um, whether they were looking at uh, just warming, multiple stressors or acidification. Um, so what is clear if I crouch is that um, uh, acidification studies really only started appearing in like the 2010s and especially multiple stressor studies really have not become a thing since like 2015. Um, so this is still a relatively nascent field. Um, oh yeah, and I should say I stopped, I stopped collecting papers like mid 2021. So I don't have anything past that, but I will say this, this trajectory continues upwards. Um, in terms of the global reach of these studies, um, I got a pretty even global distribution. You'll notice there's nothing in the tropics because kelp do not live in the tropics. They are a purely temperate species. Um, but you can definitely see that there are kind of some research hotspots that jump out where the points are really densely concentrated. Like California is a research hotspot, um, Chile, because uh, they've had some really um, interesting kelp declines. Um, there's this one island, um, the um, uh, Svalbard has like a kelp research station up there. And so there are a ton of papers that have come out of that. How else there is Svalbard? Yeah, <laughs> they're just, they have like a, they have these um, seaweed cultures that they've actually been keeping active for like decades now. And so people just do, um, they have like an endless supply of little gametophytes, which I am so jealous of. After, after trying to keep gametophytes alive for like a couple of months this summer, I'm like, how have you guys kept these alive for years? This is so crazy. Um, so they have like an endless supply. They just can turn out experiments. It's so cool. Um, you'll see that up here in the Pacific Northwest, uh, it, we have a few studies, but it's pretty limited, especially compared to California. And especially when you think about the huge diversity of kelp taxa that we do have here. Um, Looking at uh, life stages, I would say there's a pretty good um, representation of all four of the sort of general life stage categories. 
Um, but definitely sporophytes, it's a lot more common to see research on them just because they're easier to keep alive. Um, and then spores are the hardest to do research on. So there's less experiments on them. Um, in terms of species, there's definitely a few like model organisms that most people do research on. Um, and most of these correspond to important aquaculture species like sugar kelp, um, and then really important ecological, like ecologically, like um, giant kelp. And then bull kelp, there's not that much research done on it, which makes me sad. Um, <laughs> but we're actively working on changing that. <laughs> um, okay, so the actual math. Um, I know that this is a quant sem, uh, but I will say this is my only math slide. I'm so sorry, you guys. <laughs> um, <laughs> But I basically, I use the metaphor package in R. Um, that works pretty well for me, would recommend. Um, I was calculating standardized effects using Hedges G. The reason I chose that is because it includes a small sample size correction. So when you're comparing studies that have really different sample sizes, so for example, maybe one study had a sample size of 100 or and another study had a sample size of four. Like how do you, that those are insanely different. So, so how do you compensate for that? Um, and Hedges G is really helpful in that scenario. Um, the downside of using this method is it studies need to report an error estimate in order to be included, um, which I mentioned earlier. So all studies had to include some kind of mean, um, some kind of measure of error, and then a sample size. And like I said, I, had to, I did have to exclude a fair number of studies that didn't have all of those elements reported. Um, so I performed a bunch of linear mixed effects models. I tested over 50 combinations of random effect variables and chose the final random effects based on low AC scores. Yeah. I see listed here like what the uh, response actually is. Like, yeah. like presumably there's a lot of complications around life, growth, growth, survival, yeah. and then across life stages. Yeah. I guess. Is that is that also like uh treated as a random effect or will we get to that later? Yeah, I, I will get to that later. Yeah, yeah, great question. Um, yeah, so I basically I have the data split up by like any factors that I think would be um, would complicate that, um, like life stage and and stressor type. Yeah, so it's coming. Um, so these linear random, I mean, what what random effects did you look at? Because change in temperature continues forever. Yeah. So is that a linear? Are you assuming linearity in the effect on the response? Or yeah, it this assumes linearity, which does have some issues, which which I can talk about. Um, it is it is definitely a flawed assumption, but it is the assumption that that I went with. Yeah. So, so the last three would be just a random effect. Yes. Yes. Um. Yeah. And so the the factors that I wasn't I wasn't really looking at in terms of like they were they were more like um confounding variables as opposed to variables I was interested in were things like the specific study, the length of the experiment, um, the species examined, and then the actual intensity of the treatment. So either how much they bumped up the PCO2 or lowered the pH or how much they bumped up the temperature. Okay, so can we get another temperature check on how people, how comfortable people are reading forest plots? Like thumbs up, thumbs middle, thumbs down on forest plots. Okay, cool. Another mix. Okay, so basically the way you read a forest plot is um, on the x-axis here, what we're gonna have effect size. Um, and on the y-axis, you're gonna have some kind of division of the data, which in this case is um, geographic location. And the forest plot is always gonna be centered around the zero line. So again, an effect size of zero is gonna mean that there's no difference between the control and the treatment. And then the larger the effect size, the larger the differences between the control and the treatment. And I transform the data so that anything that is negative also implies a negative physiological consequence. And then anything that's positive implies a positive physiological consequence. Um, so negative will be colored red, positive will be colored blue. There are no blue dots here, but they are coming um, in later slides. Um, yes, any questions about that? Yeah, these are um, eco regions. This is based on the like Nature Conservancy's eco regions, marine eco eco regions of the world, um, like divisions that they have. So I forget, I forget what they. But yeah, th these are just their their terms. So yeah. Do one of the four meter power. Got it. Got it. Power is a problem. Used to be a problem. 
interesting things. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so <laughs> this is the most basic graph I'll be showing today, but basically this is just like all of the data pooled together, split up by stressor. Um, what we can see here, oh yeah, and then uh, the point size corresponds to the number of data points um, behind that behind that finding. Um, so the main thing to see here is that warming is having a very statistically significant and strong negative effect on kelp. Um, and in comparison, acidification is not having a statistically significant effect on kelp. And then acidification and warming is also not, but you can see this data point is tiny. So we just don't have that much data um, on multiple stressors. And if you break up the data by life stage, so this is now three forest plots that are faceted together with the three different stressor scenarios. Um, so the you can see that under warming, everyone's negatively affected across the board. But interestingly, these two macroscopic stages, the two sporified stages, are more negatively affected than the microscopic stages, the gametophytes and the spores. And then what's interesting is then the trend kind of shifts when you get to acidification and multiple stressors, um, where now the adult sporophytes are actually being positively affected by acidification. And then the spores and the gametophytes, it's not statistically significant, but they are being negatively affected by acidification. And then the same thing happens under this multiple stressor scenario as under acidification. Um, so not everything is statistically significant. There's a lot of error bars here. These error bars are 95% confidence intervals. I don't think I mentioned that. Um, so, but yeah, it is, it's a really interesting trend. Yeah. So this, maybe this is where I can have my question. Yeah. I, I guess. I would think that there might be multiple responses in a life stage. And yeah. that's kind of what I'm curious about. Is yeah. Like growth versus survival. You know, you get in the- You're teeing me up for the next slide. Okay. Here, I have it divided up by response type. Um, and I also have another graph that I didn't include in this, in this PowerPoint, but that is broken up by life stage and response type. So it's just this times four. Um, but yeah, so this, this is response type and the, I, I kind of just chose uh, thinking about kind of like how the stress response pathway goes. Like if an organism is stressed out, you're probably going to see um, the stress response pathway activated. You might see some differences in enzyme activity. And then here we have sort of the, the photosynthetic pathway. So energy generation, fluorescence, photosynthesis or net primary productivity and respiration. Then you might see start to see changes in their biochemical composition and pigments. So that's going to be like chlorophyll A, chlorophyll C. Um, then um, through time, you might just sort of start to see changes in growth, reproduction, and development. Um, then finally, probably strong stress is going to cause changes in your in your overall tissue health and even survival. So that was kind of how I structured this graph. Um, again, what is clear looking at this is that warming is having a really strong negative effect on a lot of different physiological groups. Um, and in particular, it seems like things like growth, reproduction, um, and stress response are really heavily impacted. And then in contrast, under acidification, the effects are mostly positive or non-significant. And particularly, acidification is giving a bump in growth, a bump in respiration, and it's, in this case, this would, you would interpret this as they're lowering their stress response. Um, still, yeah. Jim again. Yeah. I'm still not sure what the response variable is, given you've got so many different uh, variables and you've got different measurement scales, and hence what an effect size of one needs. So we don't normally, when we do these things, what yeah. means the average effect or one degree increase in temperature. But I haven't, I, I don't see where that is coming into play in this analysis. So it's almost as if it's like a binary variable. There's uh -huh. acidification or not acidification. That's not how you usually do a meta-analysis. That's not a thing that we would normally report. So uh -huh. I'm intrigued by your response variable and how you, you know, what you define that as. So what a minus one actually means in the context. Because what warming is not a binary, it's not Boolean, really, right? It's a, yeah. It's a yeah. So what does a minus one really mean? Yeah, that's a I don't think I want a minus one. Yeah. I'm not sure what I'm getting if I've got minus if, if something is, is minus one, what is it? What does it mean? Yeah, I think in terms of interpreting these results, I think 
the actual effect size, like the actual numbers you're getting out of it are kind of not, not super useful in the sense that, like you're saying, because we are comparing um, a lot of different studies that measure stuff a across a lot of different units, I think uh, what is useful on these figures and, and with these results is sort of the general trends um because basically what i was hoping to get out of this is like um kind of a more sophisticated version of what you see sometimes in review papers when review people when review papers will report you know um in this paper uh there was there was a positive effect of this in this paper there was a negative effect of this um and they'll have I, I don't know if you guys have, I've seen this in papers before, we'll kind of, kind of just have like a big table that has like pluses and minuses in it from each paper. Um, and that involves a lot of going through studies and and really looking at the looking at the methods, looking at the results and just putting a big plus and minus on there. And then if you look at kind of the literature as a whole, then you can say like, okay, well, um, you know, this study, uh, uh, the, like X many studies found a positive result, X many studies found a negative result. But then like you're saying that leaves out a lot of other information about the study. So um, I, I think that I agree that ultimately like the effect size actual calculation doesn't tell us a whole lot. Like it's certainly not saying that, oh, um, you know, survival is going to be two times more impacted than enzyme activity or something like that um, at, at every 10 degrees Celsius that you increase in temperature. But I think this is more saying that there is a consensus amongst the literature that survival is negatively impacted by warming, whereas something like photosynthesis, there's not really a consensus in the literature. Um, there are some studies that are showing a change. There are some studies that are not showing a change. Um, so that is kind of the level of like of of uh, interpretation that I'm trying to get out of these figures. Yeah, I'm a little worried about that. Exactly. I mean, yeah, you know, that's what these graphs tell you. But there's the math underlying what you're doing that create those numbers. And you know, I think if I was writing this paper, I'd give it more detail on the response variable and how it's constructed and, and how what what an effect size means because mm -hmm. you're doing a better analysis of effects so they have a meaning there that mathematic things and how they interact you know what a confidence interval means when you've got multiple units that you're comparing is, is not well defined mm -hmm. so those confidence intervals i'm not sure what they are they're not what you normally refer to as a confidence interval are they completely yeah. Well, no, I, I, I really like it. I like this. I, I think my confusion is having to go from this back, the composition from this back to your, your original slide. Mm -hmm. It seems like it's doing a sample reading of the different these to get from this metric specific version back to the slide you had two slides ago where it's doing this sort of aggregate across it. I have no yeah. to this one. Exactly. Yeah. So this one is doing some implicit weighting across different responses. And like sometimes we use like the light table or you know there's different like common currencies that we try to interconvert them to. So any, anyway, I, I think it's super interesting. I'm just yeah, I'm also like if it's implicitly sample weighting. Or yeah, yeah. I will I will admit I'm not super familiar with with all these terms, but I am more than happy to you know go over like have you guys take a look at the R code and stuff and yeah, but. But yeah, I, I, I will be honest, I don't know all the terms off the top of my head. Um, and it's very cool. Yeah, <laughs> nice. it was awesome. yeah, yeah. I, I can let you know by looking at the R code or, or actually looking through the, the method section of my manuscript, but I, I, I don't know off the, off the top of my head, but yeah, thank you. Like yeah. But it was about like pencil. Yeah. Yeah. I'm wondering if that. Yeah. Um, but like standard. Yeah, I mean, I think 
Yeah, I think it's like one, like a minus one would be like one standard deviation larger than or smaller than the than the control. And then uh -huh. like minus two would be like two standard deviations like smaller than the control. So that sounds right. Yeah. You can compare surface. Yeah. But what mathematics means like you cannot say like okay, oh, this is ten percent larger than the control, but you can compare like between the size. That's what it is. Yeah. It's just a small sample corrected Yeah. Um, the reason why I chose this metaphor R package is because it has all of that stuff programmed in. And as someone who is less literate with the formulas, um, this was really useful for me as a non quantitative person. But um, the formulas are there in the R documentation. I just I just don't have them on hand. Um, yeah, absolutely. So you said how strong was the temperature treatment, for example? Uh huh. Was there a difference between the lab stages? Like, for example, we say you designed a study for like a more a particular generation, a yeah. stronger way, or like what was the strength of the treatment depending on the different lab stages? That's a great question. Um, I'm also plugging in my computer because it's about to die. <laughs> but um, okay, I would say there wasn't a lot of difference between um like thinking about how temperature intensity will affect different life stages. Um, I would say, okay, so this was, this was important um, because, because I was focusing on studies that were um, looking at specifically the effects of climate change. Normally when you're defining, when you're uh, designing a climate change focused study, you look at what the IPCC predictions are for how much temperature is going to increase and how much pH is going to decrease, and the IPCC releases these different RCP scenarios, depending on how much we clean up our act in terms of how much CO2 we're producing. Um, and so they'll they'll usually have like a, a best case, kind of medium case, and then a worst case scenario. So generally what people will do is basically use the ambient temperature or pH conditions that the organisms come from, and then they'll ramp it up by the different IPCC projections. So it'll be like, you know, a, a best case scenario is like two degrees Celsius increase, medium scenario is like five degrees Celsius, and then, you know, a uh, worst case scenario is more. That being said, um, I would say that is more common to do with acidification studies. Most people do follow like the specific IPCC regulations. And then when it comes to temperature, people just kind of do what they want. Um, so there is a lot of variation. And then there's also variation depending on kind of what your goals are physiologically with the experiment. So some people are more interested in just modeling what the effects of climate change are going to be. So they're looking at these very discrete increases in temperature. And then some people are more interested in really constructing a um, response curve to a stressor. So they'll look at like 10 or 15 different temperatures and really jack up the temperatures super high to unrealistic levels, just to see kind of to, to push the organism to its limit and really see like what the effects are. Um, but the actual like values that people, the actual temperature values that people are looking at were super different depending on what area of the world they're in. And again, because kelp are so hyper locally adapted in most cases, um, it would be, at least for this study, I didn't, I wasn't looking at actual discrete temperature or pH values. I was just looking at like the, the difference in the temperature between the control and the treatment variable or the difference in pH between the control and the treatment. Because for example, all of that work that was done in Svalbard, they were looking at like zero degrees Celsius versus four degrees Celsius. Whereas I think if we put kelp here in four degrees Celsius water, well, actually I've done it and they're very unhappy. Um, <laughs> They prefer 10 degrees Celsius because um, that's what they're used to. Um, so because of that, it was, um, yeah, I basically I had to look at, at the sort of the differences in, in, in between the control and the treatment as opposed to the discrete values um, between, but to answer your original question, which was life stages, I would say, I don't think that people usually, it, it's, it's a little different than, um, when we're, we're used to thinking about like 
with, with fish, for example, we think about the microscopic, like they're not microscopic, but the larval stages are going to probably be more vulnerable to climate change than, than the fish. Um, but it's actually kind of the opposite with kelp, which is really interesting because the gametophytes, um, the theory is that they basically have the ability to be really resilient to um, uh, st environmental stressors because they can basically persist as like a, a seed bank um, when conditions are poor. And you can actually replicate this in the lab. I did it this, this summer where um, if you expose them, if you like jack up the temperature, for example, they will not reproduce. They will just exist and grow larger and larger and kind of just like persist. And then if you lower the temperature back down, then they'll start to reproduce. So they've been kind of designed to like exist for as long as possible until conditions will be good for their offsprings and then they'll reproduce. So you kind of have to shift your thinking with kelp because actually we suspect that the gametophytes are, they're definitely more thermally resilient than the giant sporophytes. Um, and unclear what's going on with acidification. There's not enough data, but I would say based on this analysis, it seems like maybe they're a little bit more vulnerable to acidification than the sporophytes, which is really interesting. So it could be that these different stressors are affecting different stages and kind of targeting different stages. Yeah. Yeah. I could talk about this for hours, <laughs> but, um, yeah, I know we are short on time. Um, but I wanted to one more like interesting trend that I saw in the results was looking at geographic location. And again, this is based on nature conserve seeds. Um, the way they divide up marine regions. Um, they have several different like classification levels. Um, and this is based on another kelp paper I found um, that was like the seminal paper in 2016 that I cited earlier about one third of kelp forests are declining. They also use these eco regions. So that's why I chose them. But um, if you divide up the data just based on like very coarse geographic region, the temperate Northern Pacific, which is where we are, is actually the one that is the most vulnerable to warming. Um, which is a little concerning. And if we zoom in further, so now this is the temperate Northern Pacific, but now split up by cold temperate Northeast, cold temperate Northwest, and then warm temperate at both of those. So we're in the cold temperate Northeast. We can see that um, this one is the furthest away from the zero line. So the effect size is the largest, um, which is not great. And then another thing to note here is that this data point is the smallest out of all the data points here. So I would argue that this region is pretty understudied. You can also see that there's no data available for multiple stressors in our region of the world. Same thing if we zoom in even further. So now there's that, that last point is, is split up now and we're in this, I realize this is like impossible to see, but this point is Puget Sound and then this point is the outer coast. Um, and so what you can see is in Puget Sound, we have no data on acidification or multiple stressors. And then on the outer coast, we have no data on multiple stressors. Um, so kind of the, the point of this graph is just to show that there are a lot of knowledge gaps in our specific region of the world. Um, okay, so that is all the graphs I have. Um, yeah. Oh, okay. Um, so basically the, the things that I drew from this analysis, the first one was that ocean warming did have a strong negative impact on kelps. Um, specifically, there were some physiological endpoints like growth, reproduction, and survival that seemed particularly vulnerable to warming. Acidification was a lot more mixed. There were a lot of non-significant differences there. Um, there were generally some positive effects on endpoints like growth, respiration, stress response. Multiple stressors, I would argue that there's just not really enough data in most cases to draw concrete conclusions. There are a lot of really big error bars. Um, there's just not really a consensus amongst the literature and what's happening there. So we need more studies on multiple stressors. Um, there were slightly opposite trends happening between the macroscopic and the microscopic stages. So it seems like possibly these two stressors are going to impact sporophytes and then gametophytes and spores differently. But I would argue again that we, we need more data to support that. 
Um, and then our region of the world is seems like it's potentially particularly vulnerable to warming, or at least studies conducted in our region of the world are finding really significant effects of warming, um, which is definitely something that is a little concerning. Um, and the cool thing is that um, if you look back on this slide, which I know is again, really hard to see, but some other like statistically significant results like the like Australia has also seen really marked declines in, in kelp in response to heat waves. And then obviously in California, um, and the West Coast, we've seen declines in response to heat waves. So some of these data points that are showing like vulnerability of kelps in that specific region are also matching up to, we're seeing in the field, them declining in response to warming. So that's cool. Um, not cool for the kelps, cool for us. Um, okay, and then I think, again, like one of, one of the things I think this analysis shows really clearly is that there are some very distinct knowledge gaps in this field. Um, one of the big ones was spores. There wasn't a lot of data on spores and then obviously multiple stressors. Um, and then another thing that I think is really important that I took away from this is that reproduction was the only metric that was negatively affected by both warming and acidification, but then not by the interaction of those two stressors, but there wasn't a lot of data there. So I would argue that more studies on reproduction are really urgently needed because if warming and acidification are both negatively impacting reproduction, that could be a really critical population bottleneck. Um, and yeah, that is all I have. Um, thank you so much. And yeah, are there any other questions I can answer or Andrea can come up and look at my R code? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I don't like people. <laughs> I don't like people who do using packages of sharing a nation of exactly what's in their packages. Yeah, just because it's published on brand doesn't mean it's right. I did a lot of research when I was looking into the R packages, but it was in 2020. So, um, as I think a lot of people can relate to, I genuinely cannot tell you anything from that time period. I just remember that I did it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's thank Miranda. <laughs> and uh, we'll take questions around the room if we have any. We've got two minutes. Yeah. Folks online, too. Um, I have a question. Of, um, I have a question about the stress response term. So when I yeah. think about stress response for animals, I think about the hospital things or um, yeah, so that was, um, it, it was exactly that. Um, okay. the most people were studying, most people were looking at heat shock proteins and, um, some oxidative stress enzymes and stuff. Um, but I'd say HSP 70 was the big one that people were looking oh. at. Um, I think I, I didn't show this figure, but, um, I also broke down, so like within the stress response category, I listed like all the variables and looked at effect size of all of them individually. And I will say that even though heat, um, heat shock protein 70 was like the most commonly measured um, sort of stress response metric, it was not really responsive to warming. So I think that that, that is kind of like the, the, the standard way that, that people measure um, stress response to warming is by looking at heat shock proteins and specifically this one heat shock protein 70. Um, I would say in kelps, it seems like it's maybe not the best metric to use to, to look at, um, response to warming because it doesn't seem as responsive as other metrics. Yeah. Yes. Down, but then you don't know is it the absence of chocolate stress yeah or the presence? It's really, it's really yeah I totally agree and I think that is like a definitely a limitation of this analysis is that because it is linear it doesn't capture this like response curve that we see with a lot of variables that either the x-axis here is like intensity or time right things like um things like stress response or a uh, photosynthesis, we would expect to 
like under, under stress, if this is, um, if this is like stress or intensity, for example, you would expect under a slight amount of stress, things like photosynthesis are going or stress response are going to increase as the organism con compensates for that stress. And then under extreme amounts of stress, um, it's going to decrease again. So a linear model is perhaps not the best way to capture this difference because depending on where you're hitting it in the curve, um, it's going to, it's going to show a response or it's not going to show a response. So I think this is definitely a limitation of this method. Um, I will say another project that I was involved in before I started grad school was this thing called threshold analysis, which was a little different, but basically um, there's papers on it. If you're curious, this was kind of like a, a new thing that my PI at the time was kind of trying where we just threw all of the raw data onto a graph. And this was in, in this case, everyone was looking at the exact same variable with the exact same units. And then we were looking at change in pH. Um, and we had software like kind of tell us where there was sort of this, this change where it went from a, a less intense slope to a more intense slope. And then we convened a, a panel of physiological experts from around the world to come together and say whether they thought the software was correct and how much confidence they had in that variable. Um, and we ended up with this matrix that looked like this, that um, is a little terrifying, but basically um, they came up with stuff like, okay, uh, we think that survival is gonna be ne negatively impacted by pH for larvae at seven days. And we are, let's see, like medium amount of evidence and medium amount of agreement between experts that this is real. And we think that that is going to happen at a pH of 7.68. Um, the reason we did this is because this was for the state of California and they, because it was part of this larger modeling project, they were really interested in having these very discrete pH values because managers love very specific numbers. So they wanted like specific values that they could say, okay, at this value, this is gonna happen. Um, this was a very unpopular way to do it amongst the expert panel that we convened because this is like the opposite of the way that you're taught to think about stuff in science, right? That you, you wanna just put one number on it and be like, at this number, this is gonna happen. Um, but it was a really interesting exercise to witness um, and as you can see, the degree of confidence was generally like pretty low. Like no one was, no one was up here where they were like high, con high confidence, high mm -hmm. evidence. Um, but there was a lot of like low confidence, low evidence over here. Um, but yeah, it was, it was really interesting exercise. And, um, I think this is kind of like another way that, that you could, you could go about kind of thinking about trends in the literature. If you're not super worried about it being super quantitative and you just kind of want to look at consensus across the literature. Um, yeah. And I know I'm at time, so I'll stop there, but yeah. Um, yeah, okay, so let's thank Miranda again. Um, and join us next week. We have um, Luo Liangxi from the other university, uh, the other UW, um, University of Wisconsin, Madison. Um, he'll be giving us the talk. That's UW.